Knowledge is like the bee that made that sweet honey. You have to chase it through the pages of a book. Hello, amigos and flamingos. Welcome back to Storytime with Gilbert Ian. Today, I present to you Thank You, Mr. Fokker by Patricia Polacco. It is a touching and emotional story about a student with special needs and a teacher who is unwilling to give up on her. I most admire Patricia Polacco for her willingness to share her deeply personal story with the rest of us. I cannot help but think of all the children she has helped through her personal story, who can relate to her, and therefore feel less alone in this world. As an educator myself, I found this book to be an incredibly uplifting and delightful story about a teacher who is willing to go the extra mile to help a student in need. But the story about Mr. Fokker does not end there. The real Mr. Fokker was a man of many, many talents. A simple Google search will demonstrate just how loved and admired he was by all of his students, both children and adults. He was creative, passionate, multifaceted, kind, caring, compassionate, and extremely encouraging of his students. He died on April 11, 1998 at the age of 64. He would have been 86 years old this week. Rest in peace, Mr. Felker, AKA Mr. Falker. So I wanted to do something a little different today because my flowers are blooming. These are my favorite roses. I have, I have four different groups of roses throughout my property. These are my favorite because they're right outside of my bedroom. I have some for my sister in her memory. I have some for my mother, even though she's alive. <laughs> Just an excuse to buy roses. And then I have some other roses back there somewhere. But these are my favorite because I just love it. Thank you, Mr. Fokker by Patricia Polacco. To George Felker, the real Mr. Fokker, you will forever be my hero. The grandpa held the jar of honey so that all the family could see, then dipped a ladle into it and drizzled honey on the cover of a small book. The little girl had just turned five. Stand up, little one, he cooed. I did this for your mother, your uncles, your older brother, and now you. Then he handed the book to her. Taste. She dipped her finger into the honey and put it into her mouth. What is that taste? The grandma asked. The little girl answered, sweet. Then all of the family said in a single voice, yes, and so is knowledge. Knowledge is like the bee that made that sweet honey. You have to chase it through the pages of a book. The little girl knew that the promise to read was at last hers. Soon she was going to learn to read. Trisha, the littlest girl in the family, grew up loving books. Her school teacher mother read to her every night. Her red-headed brother brought his books home from school and shared them. And whenever she visited the family farm, her grandfather and grandmother read to her by the stone fireplace. When she turned five and went to kindergarten, most of all she hoped to read. Each day she saw the kids in the first grade, across the hall reading. And before the school year was over, some of the kids in her own class began to read. Not Trisha. Still, she loved being at school because she could draw. The other kids would crowd around her and watch her do her magic with the crayons. In first grade, you'll learn to read, her brother said. They were all holding our neighborhood, their first reader, sounding out letters and words. They said, be, be, oi, boy, and la, la, uk, look. The teacher smiled at them when they put all the sounds together and got a word right. But when Trisha looked at a page, all she saw were wiggling shapes. And when she tried to sound out words, the other kids laughed at her. Trisha, what are you looking at in that book? They'd say. I'm reading, she'd say back to them. But her teacher would move on to the next person always when it was her turn to read. Her teacher had to help her with every single word. And while the other kids moved up into the second reader and third reader, she stayed alone in our neighborhood. Trisha began to feel different. She began to feel dumb. The harder words got for the little girl, the more and more time she spent drawing, how she loved to draw, or just sitting and dreaming, 
or when she could going for walks with her grandmother. One summer day, she and her grandma were walking together in the small woods behind their farm. It was twilight. The air was sweet and warm. Fireflies were just coming up from the grasses. As they walked, Trisha said, Grandma, do you think I'm different? Of course, her grandma answered. To be different is the miracle of life. You see all those little fireflies? Everyone is different. Do you think I'm smart? Trisha didn't feel smart. Her grandmother hugged her. You are the sweetest, smartest, quickest, dearest little thing ever. Right then, the little girl felt safe in her grandma's arms. Reading, it didn't really matter very much. Trisha's grandma used to say that the stars were holes in the sky. They were the light of heaven coming from the other side. And she used to say that someday she would be on the other side where the light comes from. One evening, they lay on the grass together and counted the lights from heaven. You know, her grandma said, all of us will go there someday. Hang on to the grass or you'll lift right off the ground and there you'll be. They laughed and both hung on to the grass. But it was not long after that night that her grandma must have let go of the grass because she went to where the lights were on the other side. And not long after that, Trisha's grandpa let go of the grass too. School seemed harder and harder now. Reading was just plain torture. When Sue Ellen read her page or Tommy Bob read his page, they read so easily that Trisha would stop to watch the top of their heads to see if something was happening to their heads that wasn't happening to hers. And numbers were the hardest thing of all to read. She never added anything right. Line the numbers up before you add them, the teacher would say. But when Trisha tried, the numbers looked like a stack of blocks wobbly and ready to fall. She just knew she was dumb. Then one day, her mother announced that she had gotten a teaching job in California, a long way from the family farm in Michigan. Even though her grandma and grandpa were gone, the little girl didn't want to move. Maybe though, the teachers and kids in her new school wouldn't know how dumb she was. She and her mother and brother moved across the country in a two-tone 1949 Plymouth. It took five whole days. But at the new school, it was the same. When she tried to read, she stumbled over words. The ca ca cat cat ran. She was reading like a baby in the third grade. And when her teacher read along with them and called on Trisha for an answer, she gave the wrong answer every time. Hey, dummy, a boy called out to her on the playground. How come you're so dumb? Other kids stood near him and they laughed. Trisha could feel the tears burning in her eyes. How she longed to go back to her grandparents' farm in Michigan. Now Trisha wanted to go to school less and less. I have a sore throat, <coughs> she'd say to her mother. Or, I have a tummy ache. Mm. She dreamed more and more and drew more and more and she hated, hated, hated school. Then when Trisha started fifth grade, the school was all a buzz. There was a new teacher. He was tall, he was elegant. Everybody loved his striped coat and slick gray pants. He wore the neatest clothes. All the usual teacher's pets gathered around him. Stevie Joe and Alice Marie Davy and Michael Lee. But right from the start, it didn't seem to matter to Mr. Fokker which kids were the cutest, or the smartest, or the best at anything. Mr. Fokker would stand behind Trisha whenever she was drawing and whisper, This is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Do you know how talented you are? 
When he said this, even the kids who teased her would turn around in their seats and look at her drawings. But they still laughed whenever she gave a wrong answer. Then one day, she had to stand up and read, which he hated. She was stumbling through a page in Charlotte's web, and the page was going all fuzzy when the kids began to laugh out loud. Mr. Fokker, in his plaid jacket and his butterfly tie, said, Stop! Are you all so perfect that you can look at another person and find fault with her? That was the last time anyone laughed out loud or made fun of her, all except Eric. He had sat behind Trisha for two whole years, but he seemed almost to hate her. Trisha didn't know why. He waited by the door of the classroom for her and pulled her hair. He waited for her on the playground, leaned in her face and called her Toad. Trisha was afraid to turn any corner for fear Eric would be there. She felt completely alone. The only time she was really happy was when she was around Mr. Fokker. He let her erase the blackboards, only the best students got to do that. He patted her on the back whenever she got something right, and he looked hard and mean at any kid who teased her. But the nicer Mr. Fokker was to Trisha, the worse Eric treated her. He got all the other kids to wait for her on the playground, or in the cafeteria, or even in the bathroom, and to jump out and call her stupid or ugly. Dumbbell. Stupid. Ugly. Not one of us. You don't belong. You dummy. Stupid. Toad. Stupid. No hoper. You're ugly. You don't even count. Hey dummy. Stupid. And Trisha began to believe them. She discovered that if she asked to go to the bathroom just before recess, she could hide under the inside stairway during the free time and not have to go outside at all. In that dark place, she felt completely safe. But after recess, Eric followed her to her secret hiding place. Have you become a mole? <laughs> he laughed and he pulled her out into the hallway and danced around her. Dumbbell, dumbbell, maggoty, old dumbbell. Trisha buried her head into her arms and curled up into a ball. Suddenly, she heard footsteps. It was Mr. Fokker. He marched Eric down to the office. When he came back, he found Trisha. I don't think you'll have to worry about that boy ever again, he said softly. What was he teasing you about, little one? I don't know, Trisha shrugged. Trisha was sure Mr. Fokker believed that she could read. She had learned to memorize what the kid next to her was reading. Or she would wait for Mr. Fokker to help her with a sentence. Then she'd say the same thing that he did. Good, he would say. Then one day Mr. Fokker asked her to stay after school to help wash the blackboards. He put on music and brought out little sandwiches as they worked and talked. All at once he said, let's play a game. I'll shout out letters, you write them on the board with the wet sponge as quickly as you can. A, he shouted. She wiped a watery A. Eight, he shouted. She made a watery eight. Fourteen, three, D, M, Q, he shouted out. He shouted out many, many letters and numbers. Then he walked up behind her and together they looked up at the board. It was a watery mess. Trisha knew that none of the letters or the numbers looked like they should. She threw the sponge down and tried to run. But Mr. Fokker caught her arm and sank to his knees in front of her. You poor baby, he said. You think you're dumb, don't you? How awful for you to be so lonely and afraid, she sobbed. But little one, don't you understand? You don't see letters or numbers the way other people do. You've gone to school all this time and fooled many, many good teachers. He smiled at her. That took cunning and smartness and such, such bravery. Then he stood up and finished washing the board. We're going to change all that, girl. You're going to read. I promise you that. Now, almost every day after school, she met with Mr. Fokker and Miss Pleasy a reading teacher. They did a lot of things she didn't even understand. At first she made circles in sand 
and then big sponge circles on the blackboard going from left to right, left to right. Another day they flicked letters on a screen and Trisha shouted them out loud. Still other days she worked with wooden blocks and built words. Letters, 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 words, 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 always sounding them out. And that felt good. But though she'd read words, she hadn't read a whole sentence. And deep down, she still felt dumb. And then one spring day, had it been three months or four months since they had started, Mr. Fokker put a book in front of her. She'd never seen it before. He picked a paragraph in the middle of the page and pointed at it. Almost as if it were magic, or as if light poured into her brain, the words and sentences started to take shape on the page as they had never had before. She marched them off to... Slowly, she read a sentence, then another, and another, and finally, she read a paragraph, and she understood the whole thing. She didn't notice that Mr. Falker and Miss Pleasy had tears in their eyes. That night, Trisha ran home without stopping to catch her breath. She bounded up the front steps, threw open the front door, and ran through the dining room to the kitchen. She climbed up and grabbed a jar of honey. Then she went into the living room and found the book on the shelf, the very book that her grandpa had shown her many years before. She spooned honey on the cover and tasted the sweetness and said to herself, The honey is sweet, and so is knowledge. But knowledge is like the bee who made the honey. It has to be chased through the pages of a book. Then she held the book, honey and all, close to her chest. She could feel tears roll down her cheeks, but they weren't tears of sadness. She was happy. She was so very happy. The end. I bet you're wondering what happens next. How did the rest of the year go? What happened to Mr. Fokker? Well, let's find out. The rest of the year became an odyssey of discovery and adventure for the little girl. She learned to love school. I know because that girl was me, Patricia Polacco. I saw Mr. Fokker again 30 years later at a wedding. I walked up to him and introduced myself. At first he had difficulty placing me. Then I told him who I was and how he had changed my life so many years ago. He hugged me and asked me what I did for a living. He hugged me and asked me what I did for a living. Why, Mr. Fokker, I answered. I make books for children. Thank you, Mr. Fokker. Thank you. What a heartwarming tribute for teachers everywhere. I hope you've enjoyed story time with me this week. This book is so special, so heartwarming and emotional. That is probably one of the reasons why I wasn't crazy like I usually am. I hope you'll join me next week for another story. Thank you so much for joining me in my garden. I hope to see you again next week. And as always, much love and virtual hugs for you all. Bye.